Garden Success is brought to you in part by the Arbor Gate, featuring unusual plants, artisan-created decorative pieces, and a constantly changing array of items that bring beauty, comfort, and even flavor to the home and garden. Arbor Gate, 15635 FM 2920, Tomball, Texas, 281-351-8851 or arborgate.com. Garden Success is also brought to you by the Farm Patch Produce Market and Garden Center, 3519 South College Avenue in Bryan, 979-822-7209. Welcome to Garden Success with Skip Richter, the show designed to help you have a bountiful garden and a beautiful landscape. Call in now with your lawn and garden questions at 979-845-5689 or email your questions to gardensuccess at tamu.edu. And now, Texas A&M AgriLife Extension Horticulturist, Skip Richter. Hello and welcome to Garden Success. Well, this is a good time to be inside listening to gardening shows on the radio instead of outside gardening, at least this part of the day it is. Uh, so uh, we hope that you uh, enjoy today. We're going to answer your questions on gardening. Uh, if you would like to call in, we'd love to have you. It's 845-5689, 845 5689 or if you would like to email, perhaps attach a photo of a plant uh, or a plant problem, it's garden success one word, at tamu dot edu. T-A-M-U dot edu. And let's go to the phones now and talk to Randall. Hello, Randall. Hello, how are you? I'm well, how are you? Doing great, doing great. I was just wondering if you got an email from me. Uh, about the Yopons. Yeah, and I, and I sent you some pictures of what I want to do around the border of it. But, mm -hmm. uh, you know, my questions were, you know, um, is that a good spot? You know, it, it gets some sun, mm -hmm. some shade, you know, and also uh, planting them now. Is okay. It, would it be okay? Is that crepe myrtle on the north, south, east, or west side of that bed? Oh, boy. Hit it on, I think, here. Yeah. You know, I'm not really sure. I okay. get more I get I get some morning sun there and then I get mm -hmm. some afternoon sun okay. on that corner edge. Okay. Um but That's good. Yeah, it's going to they're going to be around the edges of it, you know. Okay. Well, uh dwarf yopon does well here. Uh it um can tolerate some shade and it can also tolerate absolute full sun. In fact, it kind of likes that. Uh but I've seen them growing in moderate shade and doing pretty well. Um, so that would be my first thought uh, if you want to plant them. Uh, the best time to plant is when we get into the fall. Uh, it, it just the, the days are mild, the demands are low. Uh, technically, you can plant uh, a dwarf yopon 12 months out of the year, but the chances of it dealing with the shock of the transplanting and the water in that root zone, which is still going to be just in the same shape the container was uh, underground, Keeping it moist but not too wet, it's really, really difficult when the demands are 100 degrees. Uh, so I would, I'd hold off and uh, let the weather break at least and then uh, plant them then. Ideally, maybe October, November would be great. But uh, if you want to go ahead with it, just remember those things have been growing in pot in a nursery. And so every day, maybe twice a day, they've been watered at the nursery to supply that confined root system. When you put them in the ground, you got to keep that up. Uh, we always say deep, infrequent watering, but with this situation, it is about a gallon of water uh, twice a day right at the base of the plant to go right down where the roots are. Uh, okay. And so, the, you know, that would, that would be the touch-and-go version. Okay. Okay. Well, I appreciate that. All right. Well, enjoy them. Those are, you know, those plants, we, we typically see them sheared like uh, they are in the nursery tag. Uh, you know, t to look like little landscape meatballs uh, yeah. everywhere. Yeah, no, they look. Like and and if you like, the, yeah, if you like yeah. that look, that that's fine. I think Dr. Seuss would love that look, uh, but I I kind of like a more natural look to them. You know, with it, it, number one, it keeps you from having to shear them all the time to maintain that look. Uh, right. But uh, they can also grow in a more natural form. If you plant them close together, you can even make a hedge out of it. You know, a knee-high hedge if that's what you want. Right. 
Uh, but yeah, just just think about that as you get ready to do some pruning. Okay. What what is their growing rate, by the way? They they are slow. Um, and and uh, the, you know the idea is they're dwarfs, so they're at some point they're not going to get much bigger. Although I've seen very old ones, you know, get up I don't know 30 inches high. Uh, but with any kind of shearing, you can keep that from happening. Okay, so like when you say slow, are we talking just a couple of inches a year, uh, a little bit more? Well, when they're young, if you if you take good care of them, keeping the soil always moist, not soggy, and if you fertilize them moderately. Uh, a couple times a year, uh, you can probably get a, a decent growth rate out of them more than a couple inches a year for sure. Uh, but uh, it, first, they're going to have to establish. Plants are smart in this way; they they know I need to get some roots down before I try to grow, uh, and and that right. typically happens early on. Uh, so if you if you fall planted them, they've got all the way until next summer to get those roots down. Uh, when spring comes, they're much more ready to grow than they would be if you planted them now. Okay, and I did bring some, and I, I'm bringing. I bought I bought some um, uh, some conditioned soil to put down in the bottom of the you know, the hole I build so they can have you know not just the yeah clay and stuff like that. So I'm trying to really help them along here. Well, know? what what I would recommend you do, especially with the clay soil, is you put that better soil down and spade or rototill or whatever as deep as you can get it down in the soil and then dig the hole to plant rather than just putting the good stuff in the bottom of the hole uh, right the clay holes can become underground bathtubs especially when it rains too much uh, or if the irrigation's on too much and uh, that's really bad for the roots and so they're better off if you can amend the top six inches of soil they'll be very happy happier than if you threw something in the bottom of the hole oh okay okay good to know yeah. Okay. Well, uh, we'll try and see what happens. All right. Well, All right. good luck with it. Thank you. Thanks for the call. Our phone number is 979-845-5689. 845-5689 or by email garden success at tamu dot edu. Uh, we're going to go to the emails here and... We've got a question, uh, uh, email from uh, Rosina and Thomas, uh, and it's about watering. Uh, there's some dead areas in the lawn in the photo, and uh, they've been using some cans to catch water as they run the sprinkler. Uh, and a certain amount of time, they caught a, a quarter inch of water. So just remember, when we water uh, our lawns, we want to catch at least a half inch. Uh, so however long that takes. You may have a sprinkler system that can put out water pretty fast, which most can, and the soil can't take it in that fast, and so you get runoff if you try to put a half, unless it, certainly if you try to put an inch down. Uh, an inch is a good deep soaking, by the way, and if, when you water that much, you don't need to water uh, all the time. I've got areas in my yard, even with this heat, that I'm not even watering once a week, um, and I know that's, you know, it's not the greenest, prettiest golf course looking lawn on the block for sure but uh, it's saving water and uh, it's helping the plants get get through this uh, but if you can put down at least I would say two-thirds of an inch would be a good place to start uh, for a lawn uh, and then give that good deep soaking you shouldn't have to water very often now having said that uh, the symptoms in the photo are large streaks of dead area uh, and and then some areas that are just kind of mottly uh, living dead um, so I think there's two things that we need to note. No, the large streaks are somehow related to equipment. Uh, it could be m pushing the lawnmower across it or a riding lawnmower going across it. Uh, it could be something related to a fertilizer spreader that was, was uh, not, uh, that may be putting out a, a product that could hurt lawns uh, like a weed and feed in the season when the lawns least can take it. But I think it's more of a physical damage from the mowing, uh, the blade, and the, the um, just the traffic of going through there mowing. That uh, Nature does not know how to make those kind of streaks in a lawn. So that, that's something mechanical. Uh, w there are some, there is some uh, research-based information out there on, a, I can't remember if they call it scorching or there's a, it, it looks like they're scorched, but when when grass is very stressed, water stressed, and or, or maybe it's water stressed because the roots are dying, uh, but uh, and then you run a, an equipment over it, 
you can get it's just like you just have a burn streak across there from the effects of the the weight of the wheels or or some other uh, effect it could be the blades too so if that if that blade is is not sharp uh, and if the grass is kind of semi wilty when you mow uh, that's when you can often get some of that kind of damage so you might check that make sure the blade's sharp and uh, if you're when you water and you get the leaves perking up uh, you know the next morning they look good sometime in the next day or two go ahead and mow uh, and then that's a better time to make that that mowing so the third thing I would say is because of the modeliness of the dieback I, I think you might have a disease called take all root rot going on now I can't diagnose take all from a picture but I've seen enough take all to where I kind of know how it ends up making the lawn look uh, number one uh, it dies out in irregular areas not round circles not streaks uh, number two you often get kind of a chlorotic yellowish leaf uh, symptom that's part of that process of it dying uh, because take all is a root rot it kills roots and if you don't have roots you can't take up nutrients and, and iron is taken up at the root tip so it's often uh, uh, an early sign of take all take all root rot uh, to do that uh, let's see I'm gonna send you a response that has a website that tells you how to take a take a, a lawn sample uh, it's on YouTube it's, it's a video I did a number of years ago but it tells you how to take a sample and if you'll do that and bring it to the AgriLife Extension office uh, we'll take a look at it you know we are the uh, we're the low-end diagnosers I guess uh, we're <laughs> no cost but uh, we can diagnose a lot of stuff. Uh, if we're not able to to handle it there, then then going up to the state plant clinic, uh, and which they, they do charge a fee because they have a lot of really nice expensive equipment that helps take it from low end diagnostics up to the top, and so it may be necessary to uh, take a sample to the diagnostic lab. But let's start by looking at it here at the local level, the county extension office, and I'll be glad to do that. I will reply to your email with a link to that that web. Um, uh, video. Uh, let's see our phone number 845-5689 845-5689 or by email at gardensuccess at tamu dot edu gardensuccess at tamu dot edu uh, this is uh, had an interesting email uh, come in from Linda uh, about some zinnias that reseeded, which zinnias will do, but some of the plants don't have the normal zinnia-looking flower. They look almost like little globes, and I uh, I have not seen this before. Uh, you learn something new every day. I do not know uh, if maybe in the parentage of the breeding line there was some of that because when when you buy zinnias you're almost well often you're buying a plant that's been crossed uh, and so when you take seed from a hybrid type plant then the results are going to come out different than the parent all the genetics that are mixed up into that hybrid start to separate out when you collect the seed and you're going to hit off all kinds of different uh, or at least two kinds of different zinnias that are coming up. So the globe thing is very strange. It's only happening to one plant uh, that I see there, or it's, it's distinct within a plant. So I think that's a genetic deal. If you want to bring, uh, cut off a couple of those or dig one up and bring it by the extension office, let me take a closer look at that. Uh, because in the photo, I, I can't fully make out uh, what's going on there. But that, that is interesting, uh, Linda. Thank you for that email. Uh, let's see, uh, Chris emails, and he has some yucca plants that have bloomed well the last uh, five to seven years, but this spring they didn't. Uh, there, of course, were other yuccas around town blooming, and so why are his plants not, and some others do? Uh, I don't know. I don't know exactly why they didn't bloom this year. Uh, we, you know, we have we have strange weather, and we always blame stuff on the weather because it's often due to the weather, but uh, I don't know if you know the freeze back in February of last year affected the plants in some way where they kinda missed a cycle uh, that is possible uh, but it also it, it also could just be uh, due to maybe a lack of sunlight or some other thing going on but that wouldn't have changed dramatically in a year so I think wait and watch and I think it'll be fine next year yucca is a tough plant it lives 
on the hillsides of Central and West Texas, where, you know, nobody's pampering that. It's lucky to even have some soil to get its roots down in some of those places. Uh, and so there's no, uh, well, you need to fertilize it or you need to water more or anything like that. It, it's If it's established, which yours are, five to seven years, uh, then I would just wait and watch, and I think it's going to do better uh, next year. Uh, let's see, it's time to go to the phones and talk now to Jake. Hello, Jake. Hi, Skip. Hey, what's up? So my wife and I recently uh, moved into a house in June, and so I'm kind of working on preparing a, a garden plan and um, getting everything figured out. But kind of looking towards the the winter slash fall time, I want to first kind of get my woody plants established. There's not really anything in the backyard to speak of. And so um, first off, I, I want to plant some pecan trees back there. Mm-hmm. And we got a pretty pretty good sized backyard. And okay. um, I know one thing I wanted to ask you about was I know you say you don't want to amend you know the hole in particular. You don't want to put any compost down in the bottom of the hole. Right. Um, but you know I I've, I've sent our soil off to get tested, and I but I just know looking at it and feeling it, it it's clay. Mm-hmm. And I was wondering what about uh, amending kind of the top six inches, you know, and like sort of like a six by six square or something like that with something like expanded shale. You know, um, I guess for the first few months or year, the plants might respond a little better to that. But long term, it's going to be of no benefit at all. And when we Mm -hmm. plant things, they've got to grow in the soil we have. If they can't do that, it's the wrong plant. Uh, Mm -hmm. uh, So... You know, a pecan tree, uh, they've washed the roots out on a pecan tree following to see how far they went, and two and a half times the height of the tree are pecan roots. So Mm -hmm. if you did a 10-foot area, it it just, the the tree is going to have 98, 99% of its roots outside that area, probably more Mm -hmm. than that. Uh, And so I, I, I don't recommend doing that. If you were planting shrubs and you had a nice large raised bed, uh, that's a smaller statured plant. It's still going to have extensive mm-hmm. roots. But I would say amend the whole bed uh, so that it's rich soil for it to grow in that's been amended. And and mm-hmm. that would be helpful. But uh, when we get to the point of trees, uh, I don't, uh, I, I just think it's going to have to grow where it is. Let me say a couple of things about pecans in town uh, or in mm-hmm. na- neighborhoods. Oh, first of all, by the way, congratulations on your new home. I'm, that's exciting. Thank you very much. So it's, it's always fun to get to have a home where you can uh, paint from scratch your landscape as you want yeah. it to look. Yeah, I'm happy to put some plants in the ground. Yeah, good. Not, doesn't pot. Mm-hmm. Well, this fall's a time to plant all your woody ornamentals and even the best time for perennials, too. Uh, but pecan trees, uh, if you have a pecan orchard and it's going to be at all successful, it's going to be on alluvial which is river bottom mm-hmm. soil. Uh, the pecan orchards, you know, in the middle of Bryan College Station, the soil we typically have here, uh, it, that would not be a profitable orchard because the trees aren't going to thrive uh-huh. in that. Uh, the other thing is uh, pecans uh, have their issues. Uh, limb drop, limb droppage, uh, there's foliar diseases and some foliar insects that can kind of make a mess of things. And then there's the squirrels in the neighborhood. And, and I think... If you if you plant a pecan tree, well, it is the state tree, and there's a sentimental uh, factor there, but I don't think uh-huh. you're going to eat many pecans. Uh, and I hate to yeah. hate to have you get you know ten years down the line and realize you know what I should have just gone with something else. Uh, but but uh, I just want to say that to kind of moderate expectations in terms of of uh, uh, large harvests. Now, if the tree yeah. is completely isolated, there's not a, a rooftop to jump to the tree or another tree or a power line to jump to the tree. You can put shields on the trunk that squirrels can't jump over or climb th- th- over. And mm-hmm. if, if it's truly isolated and you prune the limbs where they're not down low, in other words, a squirrel can't figure out how to get into that tree, uh, yeah. then you might, then you would be able to get uh, some crops. You just have to be there when they fall before a squirrel runs across the neighbor's yard and takes it. Mm-hmm. Uh, so those are just some thoughts on, on the pecan. If you're going to plant one, there's a publication on Aggie Horticulture website. It's Aggie-Horticulture. Mm-hmm. And uh, there's fruit and nut section, and there's a specific pecan uh, publication. 
and it shows you the state and which varieties are recommended in each part of the state. And over in these mm -hmm. eastern areas where we get a, a lot of rainfall compared to, let's say, west of Interstate 35, um, w the varieties that are, we recommend are very disease resistant. It doesn't mean they don't get anything, but uh, they, they are very disease resistant. And so that would give you more hope for a yard tree. Uh, the pecan mm -hmm. scab and, and several other diseases can make it where, you know, you, your tree looks bad. And so in a home yard, it, trying to spray a 40-foot pecan tree even uh, is just not practical. So right. I, that's probably more yeah. answer than you're, you ask in a question. But I wanted to throw that in there because I yeah. know other yeah, people are probably thinking about planting pecans in the yard too. Yeah, Qu quick follow-up to that. Would the amending the soil with shale be more appropriate for planting like a citrus tree? It would be. Uh, you you would just want to do a large area. I would say ten feet wide. Right. Um, mm -hmm. The the shale is a benefit if used in a significant quantity in clay soil. Yeah. If you have mm -hmm. anything other than a clay shale is not going to be a benefit. And if you just right. put an inch of shale down and rototill it in, it's not going to be a benefit. Uh, but it, probably about four inches of shale uh, mixed down as deeply as you can can make a significant difference in the internal drainage of a clay soil. And some studies yeah. by AgriLife up in Dallas uh, looked into that and, and showed that. Uh, but it, I guess the analogy I like to use is imagine you have modeling clay and I give you a few grains of sand or pea gravel and you mix it all in, what do you have? Well, now you have modeling clay with pieces of pea gravel here and there all through it. And it didn't do anything to loosen up the clay. So we got to get a quantity in there to, to get that right. benefit. Yeah, I, I've I've seen some of the videos, I believe, from Dr. Uh, George yes. on YouTube where he talks about mixing, I think it was one part compost, one part expanded shale, and one part native soil. Yes, that that's a good... That's a good recipe. And, and um, you know, for a lot of our landscape beds here, I just recommend people put the bed on top of the ground. In other words, you buy a nice bed mix and you mm -hmm. bring it in and I spread about, I'll spread about four inches, rototill it to kind of not have such a sudden interface between this wonderful store-bought soil and the heavy unimproved clay and, mm -hmm. and mix it in and then pile in you know, several more, get it up, you know, 8, 10, 12 inches high because it's going to settle down. Uh, and then your plants, the drainage around the plant is better, and they've got a good quality soil to grow in. All right. All right. Thank you, Skip. Yeah, and, and contact us about specific plants you might have questions about or, you know, how, do you, how does this do here? We're happy to answer that because this is a long-term investment in your new home, and we want, we want it to be something you're glad you did that way 20 years from now. Yes. All right. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Jake. Appreciate the call. The number is 845-5689, 845-5689, or by email, gardensuccess at tamu.edu, gardensuccess at tamu.edu. Uh, let's see here. We're going to go back to the emails, and we had a question uh, from Sherry. Uh, Sherry had some tomatoes that uh, had blossom end rot on them, and uh, blossom end rot is caused by a lack of calcium reaching the end of the tomato. That's why the end rots. It's, it's the very end. And often we see blossom end rot on the earliest tomatoes of the year, and then it kind of goes away. Uh, because the, I guess the plant doesn't quite have the root system as extensive early on, or maybe it's a soil temp factor. But anyway, uh, but it's typically caused by fluctuations in soil moisture. So if you're if you're in a container and it dries out, and then you water it real good, and then you know it dries out, or or if that happens in the soil, uh, that disrupts that nice flow of calcium up into the plant. And oftentimes the soil test says you've got enough calcium but you're seeing blossom end rot. Well, the problem isn't the lack of calcium in the soil, it's the conditions that prevent it from getting to the end of the tomato. And so uh, I think uh, Cherry had asked about uh, like ground eggshells being put down in the soil, and that doesn't hurt anything to, to put some ground eggshells, uh, but the form uh, and the availability of the calcium in an eggshell 
is is not very great um, and and you can see this you bury an eggshell and you know just a chunk of eggshell not a little ground up and uh, go back and look at it two years later dig it up and look at it and I know nobody's gonna do that but if you did you would find that it still looked like an eggshell it would just be kinda tea stained brown from the organic matter in the soil uh, but it, it's just not a great form and it's a popular thing on social media to recommend ground eggshells or or you know put them in your compost or whatever there's nothing wrong with that and it is calcium uh, but number one look at the soil test I bet your soil has enough calcium maybe it doesn't but I more than likely it has enough calcium and in this area and uh, then if you needed some lime or some calcium then put a form of lime that's readily available a dol dolomitic lime uh, is fine uh, just a, a more available form of lime some of some forms of calcium are very very slow to become available uh, so I think that probably is uh, the best way to deal with it. Uh, I think also just uh, watch that soil moisture. Uh, now the, the rot that was at the blossom end rot early in the season, now uh, she's seeing some rot or soft spots on the top of the tomato. And those are often due to sunburn or sun scald on the tomato. Uh, the top is the part the sun would hit if you don't have adequate leaf cover covering that fruit. Uh, and a fruit sticking out, uh, you know, exposed to the hot western sun when it's 105 degrees outside, uh, it just burns. It, it just burns it. And, uh, you know, a good healthy plant with lots of foliage can shade that fruit and help avoid that. But once you see that kind of burn, uh, often it'll progress into kind of a creamy white sunken area that they then eventually will turn brown. If you're just seeing the rot itself, it could be from some old damage. Uh, it could be possibly from uh, moisture that settles there, especially around the stem end uh, when you irrigate or get rain. That's the spot on the tomato, just based on the way a tomato hangs down. That's the spot that collects and holds some water right there at the stem connection. And sometimes we'll get, if it's frequently kept wet, we may get some decay from that too. Uh, but those are just some thoughts, Sherry. Congratulations, first of all, on having tomatoes this time of year. That's a, that's a green thumb accomplishment in and of itself. Our phone number is 979-845-5689, 845 5689 or by email at garden success at tamu.edu. And let's talk about some things going on around town. Um, on Saturday, July 23rd, which is this Saturday, at the Brazos Valley Museum of Natural History, they're going to have their annual Wish Upon a Butterfly event. It's uh, That's out at 3232 Briarcrest Drive in Bryan, uh, out at the Brazos. Uh, Center out there. Uh, 9.30 a.m. to noon is the event. There'll be a butterfly release to honor someone if, if, if you wanted to, to uh, do that. But there's a, there is a, uh, a ticket purchase that you need to purchase one per family, not per person, but per family. That gets you into the museum, first of all, which is, which is well worth it. And then the, you'll get to see in there, and the, uh, the kids will love this, but an observation beehive where you can watch the bees working. Uh, it also includes some butterfly displays that are really cool and live music, refreshments, and activities. And if you dress up as a caterpillar or a butterfly, you get a gift. There's a free gift uh, for that. So uh, the butterfly purchase, if you wanted to purchase one as a release for um, uh, in memory or honor of a family member, they're $20 or 6 for t for $100. Uh, and I'm sure that goes to a very good cause as well. The Brazos Valley Museum org is the website Saturday, this Saturday, July 23rd from 9.30 a.m. to noon. Our phone number is 845-5689 and we're going to go back to the phone now and talk to Kim. Hey, Kim. Hi, good morning. How are or you? Good afternoon. Sorry. Yeah, yeah, I never know what to say. I mean, because technically it's afternoon, but it's really just noon. <laughs> Just hot. That's all I know. There you go. Um, I was wondering if you could give me some good tips on how to get rid of grasshoppers without using an insecticide. There's not a great way. Okay. Uh, row cover fabrics can help exclude them, but grasshoppers can eat through row cover fabric, uh, mm -hmm. you know, if they're hungry enough. Um, 
you said not using an insecticide, but I'm thinking you prob probably mean a synthetic insecticide. Right, uh, a chemical uh -huh. insecticide. So right. there's, a, there's a product called Nolobate, N-O-L-O, -O, and it is a disease of grasshoppers. And if you can treat the area where they're growing up, uh, it's effective. You don't once they're flying around jumping on your plants. No low bait is no no use. Uh, okay. But when These they have very large grasshoppers, more like locusts that just won't seem to stay off my um, plants in the butterfly garden. Okay. Uh, are they what color are they? Green with some brown. Okay. Yeah, I, I know the kind you're talking about. Uh, well. If you could, you know, once they have wings, they go, they fly, and they often will yeah. fly from a grassy field into your your uh, lawn. Uh, but if you could treat the area where they are hatching out, when the the nymphs have to hop around. They don't have any wings, and the nolo bait will will get rid of them in that stage. But it's not easy to do, especially if you're having to treat a very large area. There's going to be some expense there. So once the grasshoppers are up and flying in. I do not know, other than a chemical insecticide, uh, I don't know a good way to kill them. Uh, that You know, it's, you can't put a night light out and attract them to it or any other thing. Uh, they are what they are, so covering the plants to protect them would be the only thing that comes to my mind. If we've got any entomologists listening in that know better, uh, please do let us know. I've tried to catch a few of them, but, but it's hard. They seem to really like the milkweed more than anything else. So. Really? Okay. Yeah. My other question regarding the same plant is I have a horrible aphid infestation on some of the other milkweeds. I've used neem oil several times mm -hmm. with some soap, but it just seems like I'm continually having to go back and spray. Are these, are, any... are these yellow, deep yellow aphids, brown, uh, golden yellow color? Yes. Yes. Okay. Well... Milkweed can survive covered wall to wall with those aphids. Uh, it they are sucking juices out of the plant, but it just doesn't kill it, and it it survives. And I actually plant that milkweed in my garden because when you get those aphids on the milkweed, they're not going to go to your roses, they're not going to go to your tomatoes. It's a different aphid species, and okay. not going to go to your crepe myrtles. And you will get every beneficial insect in the world that eats aphids uh, in there. There'll be parasitoid wasps, there'll be uh, hoverfly larvae, there'll be lady beetles and lady beetle larvae, and so on. And so I look at it not as a problem, but as just a nursery for beneficial insects. And so well, I don't know if, is. yeah, I don't know if that kind of mind shift is, is possible, but if you can make it, I, I think you just don't worry about them. They'll, okay, they'll I think I was concerned because I saw that they were getting on some of the herbs that were nearby, and that started worrying me that they were going to spread. So, so you saw the same yellow aphid on the herbs? No, I just saw the white dots, and so I think okay. that's what they are. Yeah, well, there are a lot, a lot, a lot species of aphids out there, okay. and uh, they, they don't each just eat one kind of plant, but... Uh, they they do have a range, and, and I have not discovered another garden or landscape plant that this particular aphid, it's called the oleander aphid, it's one of the names for it, uh, the, even oleanders, I haven't seen them on, uh, but I haven't seen another plant that this aphid gets on, and they may be one out there or two in the landscape, but in general, uh, I have a plant, I used to have a plant right where I parked my car every day to go in the house, and Every day I get out and see it, and it'd get yellower and yellower as the aphids proliferated. And then within a week, I'd go look at it, and it's just a few aphids here and there. And I'd see the pupa of hoverflies and the, the uh, pupa of lady beetles because they had raised another uh, generation uh, off the aphids on that plant. Huh. Is there anywhere in town to buy ladybugs? I don't know any place to buy them. Uh, and we don't recommend buying a mail order. Uh, that's a, yeah. a species of lady beetle that's often collected uh, uh, when, during their hibernation is one time. Uh, and they, they just, we have lady beetles here, so if you have aphids, they will come. And you got to be patient. I had some aphids in the garden this year, and uh, I, we were not getting any beneficials on them. 
and I, I just waited and waited. I had some plants. I just let the aphids have them. And now, uh, last week, I went out, and I'm telling you there's beneficials that I had to go look up uh, because that kind of aphid crop brings in a lot of feeders that like to eat them. And so I would, I would say that's the best thing to do. If you learn what they look like and learn what their larvae look like and their pupa look like, uh, when you're out and about and you see some on a plant, you can give them a, a free ride to your house. Okay. But Sounds you got to have good. something for them to eat. Okay. Well, I'll stop treating. That's, that's great news. One less thing to do. <laughs> we got plenty to worry about. Uh, sure without. <laughs> yeah. Bye-bye. All right. Thank you, Kim. Our phone number is 845-5689, 845-5689, or by email at gardensuccess at tamu dot edu. Uh, well, it, you know, water's in the news, so I just want to mention that um, in, in uh, uh, the College Station water system uh, has been recommending watering uh, on Thursdays and Sundays if you have an even house number, and if you have an odd house number, on Wednesdays and Saturdays, and that helps spread the demand out a little bit. Uh, check with whatever water system you're on. They may have a little bit different schedule, or it may be the same one. Uh, don't water uh, between 10 a.m. and 6 p.m. Uh, we're still not on the you have to, or it's the law kind of restrictions. This is a suggestion, but uh, this is a suggestion that if uh, everybody would do it, uh, would avoid having to go to hot, to serious water restriction levels. Uh, of course, I know we've got a lot of lawn, lawn rangers out there that are on their own, and uh, they kind of do what they want to do, but just know that uh, a community that cooperates in this way, uh, your lawn's going to be fine. That's two days a week, and that is the most you need to water. Uh, I think one day a week's probably enough if it's a good watering. Uh, but two days a week, uh, so everybody can live with that. Your grass will look good. Don't worry about that. If you see leaks, uh, and uh, you can report them to the water system, it's 855-528-4278. 855-528-4278. And that's good because, my goodness, a leak wastes a lot of water. And the quicker someone can get out there and, and get it under control, uh, the more water is saved for your lawn when you need it, or for drinking water, or for showers, or all the other things we need water for. Uh, just a kind of something we learn to take for granted is you reach the spout, turn it on, and there's fresh quality drinking water available on cooking and everything else. So uh, it's one of the many benefits we enjoy these days. I want to talk about a couple of events going on. By the way, our number is 845-5689 or by email, gardensuccess at tamu.edu. Uh, the a um, uh, and Horticulture Department uh, and uh, myself at the Bryce County Extension Office are putting on a home winemaking uh, event. And the home winemaking event is going to be an opportunity, if you're interested, uh, for you to be able to do some hands-on winemaking. Uh, it's going to be at the uh, Peach Creek Vineyards, which is out um, kind of close to where Santa's, Santa's Wonderland is, south of town, but, but off to the east of there. Uh, and the Peach Creek, Peach Creek Vineyards, uh, if you're interested, uh, here's what you're going to learn. You're going to learn how to determine the ripeness of your grapes, how to harvest how to process them, uh, beginning the fermentation process, and there'll even be the opportunity to take home your own wine to finish it out there. And they'll be providing the supplies. Now, uh, Fran Pontash, one of our grape specialists, is conducting this, uh, and I'm helping, uh, but it's a uh, phone number if you'd like to call to RSVP, because I'm sure it's limited space, is 458-0131. That's the 979 area code. 4580131. If you don't get that down, call us at the extension office and we can give it to you there. Now, the cost of this is $40, but that's all the supplies. Not only are you learning how to make wine, so if you want to grow grapes in your yard, but you got the supplies to get a little batch started there. That's Tuesday, August 2nd from 8 a.m. to 11 a.m. at Peach Creek Vineyards. But you do have to RSVP, don't just show up. All right, let's see. Let's go back to the phones now and talk to Catherine. Hello, Catherine. Hi, Skip. Thanks for taking the call today. Mm -hmm. 
I'm going just to ask, during the heat stress going on, when bushes are dropping branches, or trees are dropping branches, and then bushes are becoming brown, is it best to just leave them alone and let them do as they will, or does it help at all to trim back? I would not trim them back at this point. And you may find, uh, number one, the whole plant could be killed, uh, not because you trimmed it, but because of the drought they're going through. Uh, and so if you wait, you can see where the dieback is to, and then you could do the pruning if it wasn't completely killed. Uh, and it's just uh, pruning uh, is kind of an invigorating process, and with this heat and, and drought, uh, there's not going to be a lot of invigorating. But the last thing we want them to do is try to put out some succulent, fresh, new tissues and shoots that uh, they're just going to have a heck of a time trying to support because obviously they're turning brown because they couldn't support the, the foliage they already had. So I would wait uh, and see. And if any, the earlier you can go into rescue mode on trees and shrubs, the better. Uh, if the whole thing's brown, uh, something like a post oak is probably gone. Uh, it's probably not going to come back. Uh, there are plants that can turn brown and bounce back, like the cypress trees we see around here. Uh, they can brown out, and often in August you'll see them brown out maybe a little growth at the ends of the branches. Uh, but they bounce back pretty well, but a lot of things don't. Well, that's great information. Just let them be, and we'll yeah. make our way through this drought. Yeah, make the way through the drought. Uh, rescue watering once every two weeks, a good soaking, you know, getting an inch of water out there over the ground soaked in will keep them alive. You're not supplying everything the plant would need, but, but you're keeping them alive, and uh, so that that would be within your control. And, uh, you know, if you got to go replace a tree or a shrub, that's, that's pricey, and you're having to go backwards to a little plant when you may have had a big one to begin with. Yes. All right. You've given great advice. Thank you for your help. Thank you, Catherine. I appreciate the call. Oh, you take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. 845-5689 if you'd like to give us a call, or garden success at tamu.edu if you would like to email uh, Linda uh, has a maple tree that uh, she planted last fall, and the leaves are turning brown at the ends. And is that a sign of too much or too little water or, or maybe a water quality issue like sodium? Uh, the young red oak has the, the, um, also has browning leaves, and the tree loses branches uh, like sometimes at the top and periphery. And so I'm gonna. You've got a lot of possibilities going on here, Linda, in this in this series of pictures. So I'm gonna kind of comment on all of them. Um, so first of all, a tree planted that recently has still got a very limited root system. And I would say on those young newly plants, if if you can now keep it about five feet around that tree with a good consistent moist soil, a good soaking consistently. Uh, we said established trees, you know, every two weeks is fine. That's not true with new trees. New trees uh, that are, let's say, six months or less in the ground now, uh, those things are needing to be watered, you know, every week a couple of times probably to still to keep them going. And so make sure you do that. The browns of Brown edges and tips and margins of the leaf is a sign of drought injury. It can also be a sign of fertilizer burn, but I doubt that's the case uh, with your trees. Now, the red oak that's, that's kind of tall and has yellowing leaves that are browning on the tips, it's got a major root problem. And um, sometimes oaks get sold that are native to a more acidic soil condition. We have more than one type of red oak uh, around the country, for sure. And uh, some of these uh, oaks that like a acidic soil, they just aren't going to do well in a high pH clay with the high sodium or higher, which also is sodium affects pH, water. And so it may be the wrong species. The other thing it could be is a circling root around the tree. So dig down with a hand spade or trowel around the tree. Uh, maybe use water to wash out if you need to, and look for a root that's going in a circle. You know, it'll be uh, somewhere between a six-inch circle and uh, it could be a little bit bigger, but it, it wouldn't be showing the problem if it was bigger than six inches. But you got to cut those circling roots because eventually they strangle a tree, and if it's been in for a while, 
that uh, that is a problem that we see. We often see that on Bradford pears, and you know, typically eight years down the line, uh, that circling root and the growing trunk uh, come together, and the root ends up as a strangling uh, factor on the tree. So, I would look at those two possibilities. Um, the branches that died back and didn't come back, I would prune those out. You could make that pruning cut now if you wanted. Now, the eggplant uh, is not. Uh, that you have is not uh, setting the blooms well. And eggplant's pretty tough. It, it's one of the few nightshades in our gardens that sets really well, uh, typically, even when it warms up a little bit. Tomatoes don't really like that, and even peppers don't set well in the heat. Uh, they'll set, but not as well. Uh, so that eggplant, it could just be the temperatures that we're having. Uh, it also, it could be that it's only getting some uh, morning sun. Uh, and it, Having more light helps make more carbohydrates that, that encourages bloom and fruit. But the fact that it's blooming and not setting, uh, I would just make sure it's getting plenty of water, uh, and you can't change the lighting right now on this, this plant. Uh, and hopefully as the weather breaks just a little bit, you're going to start seeing some more fruit set. Our phone number, 845-5689, 5689 or by email, at garden success at tamu.edu. Garden success at tamu.edu. Another event uh, coming up or going on around town, it relates to our extension office and our master gardening program. Uh, we are starting the new master gardening class for this fall. Uh, at uh, the end of August, the very end of August. But before you can join that class, you have to come to one of two orientation sessions, which I call information sessions, uh, because they'll let you know if they are, if, if the Master Gardener program is for you and the volunteer requirement and everything, if that fits. And so we're having one on July 27th, that's just around the corner, at 545 p.m. So you have time to get off of work and get over there for that session, uh, 545 on July 27th. The other one will be August 3rd uh, at 12 noon, the, the 3rd of August at uh, 12 noon. And uh, so hopefully you can make one or the other. Now you need to call the AgriLife Extension Office here in Brazos County, call our office, and find and make sure you get your name on the list for which one you would like to attend. At the end of those information sessions, if Master Gardening is still something you want to apply for, uh, there'll be applications that you can fill out. Uh, but we're doing them kind of early so that you have basically a month uh, because it's an extensive class. You know, we go through a number of weeks meeting every week, and that requires some um, adjusting of the schedule maybe. Uh, maybe you have to ask for, for one day a week off of work or something else. Uh, but we're giving you time to do that. So July 27th at 545 or August 3rd at 12 noon. And um, call the Extension Office. Uh, you can ask to speak to Janice, and she will make sure you get the information you need and get your name on the list so that you can be a part of that if that turns out to be something you'd like to do. Master Gardening is a wonderful, wonderful program full of wonderful people. Uh, it is a, a very extensive horticulture training class. We cover everything from soil, uh, uh, diseases, insects, um, uh, lawns, uh, vegetables, fruit, uh, water conservation, all kinds of topics. And, and we often have uh, PhD specialists that are, that are giving the talks. Uh, I give some of them myself. Uh, and uh, it's, it's a very good uh, way to learn, but it's learning with a purpose, and that purpose being to use what you learned to help us extend extension to serve more people in the county. Master gardeners are giving talks uh, for groups. They are out uh, managing a demonstration garden for educational events there. Uh, you'll see them at the library, uh, some of the libraries where they're uh, teaching kids about gardening and many, many other things uh, that they do. Uh, but the whole purpose of the Master Gardener training is to uh, have a team of volunteers that can help us uh, reach more people uh, from the AgriLife Extension program. Uh, so uh, if you're interested, call the Extension office. Let's see, I believe we have a phone call waiting from Maggie. Hello, Maggie. Hello. Good afternoon, Skip. Hey. I was just wondering, what is the best time to trim the live oaks, mainly the dead branches and maybe one that's got to go too low? 
Uh, the best time would be midwinter to late winter. Uh, so we will say January, possibly as late uh, early February, but not too much later than that. And um, uh, that way, uh, they will heal fast because the fastest time uh, for healing is early spring. Okay, so I'll just I'll put it on my list. When I trim my roses, take care of the branches. Okay, Skip, thank you so much for the information. I appreciate it. All right, well, good luck with that. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Mm-hmm. Bye. Bye-bye. All right. Okay, let's see here. Uh, our phone number, 845-5689, or by email, success at tamu dot edu. Uh, we, let's see, there's a, um, uh, oh, Bauman uh, emailed and said, please let the audience know that if they buy ladybugs, they need to release them at night or they'll fly away. Uh, you know, that is that is uh, often true. What we usually say is you want to do two things. You want to release them where there are pests because lady beetles are not philanthropic. You never hear two lady beetles saying, Mildred, there is no aphids here to eat. Uh, let's fly to the other yard. And Margaret, uh, the lady beetle, looks back and says, no, uh, they paid a lot of money for us, and they're so excited to have us here. Let's just lay eggs, and maybe our babies will starve, but we want to be here for the gardener. Of course, that's ridiculous. But uh, I, hopefully it makes a point that if they don't have something to eat, they're gone. And if you shake them out, uh, and dump them on the ground, they're going to hit and take off and fly. So what we usually do if we're releasing them, and again, I do not recommend <laughs> buying and releasing them, but if you do, uh, you just kind of open up the little bag they came in and let them crawl out. Uh, and they, as they crawl out, uh, they they hold up pretty well. I saw a demonstration by a company that sold beetles one time, lady beetles, uh, where they took a 7-Up or Sprite, and they shook it up, and then you know what happens when you shake up a can of 7-Up or Sprite, and they, they popped the lid, and it spewed 7-Up or Sprite all over the plants. And the lady beetles were gathered around each of those sugar drops, just feeding like crazy. They crawled up on the plants, because they had been released down low, gently, and they crawled up on the plants and started feeding. They, they, that's attractive to them. And uh, so that will also help kind of settle them down and uh, make them maybe want to hang around a little bit longer. Well, let's go back to the phones. Again, 845-5689, and we're going to talk to Brian. Hello, Brian. Hey, Skip. Love your show, but quick, two quick questions. Uh, got the City College Station's recommendations on uh, how often to water. Yes. But they also said to water for five minutes, let it soak in, then go back and do another five minutes, let it soak in, and et cetera, et cetera. I, I don't have that kind of time. Second question, chinch bugs. Chinch bugs are in the lawn again. Mm-hmm. And I uh, already treated them twice this year and doesn't seem to be helping. You got any yes. advice for super strong chinch bug killers? Absolutely. We, even, we had an email, too. I'll, I'll hang on and listen because I know you're busy. All right. Well, thank you for the call, Brian. Uh, thank you. Love it. Thank Thank you. you. Regarding the watering, uh, five minutes is not going to be long enough. Uh, I don't know if uh, there's probably a breakdown in communication there on that, but um, the the goal would be to turn on your sprinklers and put some straight-sided cans, like a bean can or a coffee can or tuna fish can. Put them a bunch of them all over the lawn or the area where it's getting watered. Uh, and then see how long does it take to catch an inch of water. Now, what you're going to find is you're not going to be able to catch an inch of water. At some point, you're going to see runoff, and a little short of that time is how long the sprinkler should run. Then it should go off for about 45 minutes to let it soak, and then come back on again and run until that point. And you'll kind of figure it out, and you can set your little clock to water repeatedly. But... Uh, It's not going to be like five minutes and then wait and five minutes and wait. It's going to be a longer time. But depending on the sprinkler heads that you have, the pop-up heads that just spray water continually in all directions, they put out a lot of water fast. There are rotors, and that's the stream that you see that kind of gradually moves across the lawn uh, and then comes back the other way. 
they put out water pretty fast, but not as fast as pop-ups. And then there's multi-stream rotors that look like little fingers shooting across, or little fingers of water shooting out. Uh, and as they get to the other side, uh, they sort of disappear and then new ones appear. They don't go back and forth. They just go in one direction. Those are very uh, efficient at putting out water. So you could run one of those for longer than you could, way longer than you could run a pop-up sprinkler and before you started seeing runoff. And so it's, it's your own yard, your own system, your own pressure, your own type of sprinklers, and so on. Uh, if it's a slope, you're going to have runoff faster than if it's level and, and so on like that. Uh, but just keep in mind that um, the goal is to get at least a half inch, probably better two-thirds of an inch, and maybe even up to an inch down, especially if you want to benefit the tree with that particular watering cycle. Uh, and on when you water. Now, chinch bugs. Uh, we had a, a question also from uh, Kimberly about chinch bugs. Uh, when is the best time to treat them uh, in the St. Augustine grass? Well, chinch bugs have two generations a year here. In the, in the early summer, sp spring, early summertime, there is a first generation that doesn't amount to much. And then those go through the life cycle and we get the really populous generation, typically in August. Uh, so you shouldn't have been seeing enough chinch bugs to treat in, in the past couple of months. Uh, I have not yet seen chinch bug, and I tell you right now with drought, it's kind of hard to tell whether it's chinch bugs or not until you get on your hands and knees and part the grass and look for the little insects. You can go online and see what does a chinch bug look like. There's The adults are black and white, uh, and the uh, nymphs that haven't gotten their wings yet are typically kind of a uh, reddish brown, uh, rusty color with a white band across their back. And there's a little other variation in there. But look for them, and if you see them, then it's the time to treat for chinch bugs. Uh, we don't pre treat, we don't preventatively treat for them. When they start in, in many years, they don't end up being a problem. When they start in, and they're going to be a problem, it's time to do the treatment at that time. And chinch bugs almost always start in the sun next to some type of a masonry, driveway, sidewalk, or something like that. And the grass looks like it needs watering. You water it, it doesn't get better. And it just gradually, this problem is spreading out into the lawn. And go to the edge between healthy and dead, somewhere in there is where you're going to find the most of the chinch bugs that you have. So that's kind of the quick uh, and easy on uh, chinch bugs. Uh, if, you, if you do want to take a lawn sample and you don't know what they look like, you don't know how to do that, uh, I can send you a video of how to take a lawn sample. You're going to take a little 4x4, 4x6 inch plug from that zone between healthy and dead, slip it in a Ziploc bag and zip it up right away, and then uh, bring it to the extension office and then we'll have the, the bugs in there if that's what uh, we, we are going to be treating for and going after. All right. Well, I think we uh, kind of covered a, a number of things today. So I look forward to visiting with you again next Thursday. Tell your friends about the show. Uh, it is every Thursday from 12 to 1 uh, here on KAMU-FM. And we'll look forward to another visit next week. Good luck with your gardening in the meantime. You've been listening to Garden Success with Texas A&M AgriLife Extension horticulturist Skip Richter. Join us again next week as Skip discusses your questions about gardening and landscaping in the Brazos Valley. Garden Success is brought to you in part by the Arbor Gate, featuring unusual plants, artisan-created decorative pieces, and a constantly changing array of items that bring beauty, comfort, and even flavor to the home and garden. Arbor Gate, 15635 FM 2920, Tomball, Texas, 281-351-8851 or arborgate.com. Garden Success is also brought to you by the Farm Patch Produce Market and Garden Center, 3519 South College Avenue in Bryan, 979-822-7209.